Welcome to The Humanist Report. I'm Mike Figueredo. Today's show is sponsored by Audible. You can get a free 30-day trial along with a downloadable audiobook at audibletrial.com slash humanistreport. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing Bernie Sanders and his campaign status, along with some interesting discoveries about Hillary Clinton. We'll also be talking about Donald Trump in this week's weekly roundup, as well as President Obama's double standard when it comes to human rights. Stay tuned. It's going to be a great show. Greg Gutfeld of Fox News tried to be funny by mocking Bernie Sanders. Take a look. Businessman who decided to be a politician. Business teaches you to speak your mind. Politics tell you to do the opposite. In business, you sell a product. In politics, you sell yourself. Which is why Bernie Sanders is a good politician. It's all he does. He's been running for office since 1972, affording him the luxury of selling a failed ideology that never requires purchase. Socialism. A harmless thing until it finds real power, then it's deadly. For if he could, Bernie would gladly turn us into Greece, or worse, Venezuela, where toilet paper rolls are emptier than Athens ATMs. This dope once adored the Sandinistas, a toxic bunch of commies. Sanders is so nutty, most kids should be allergic to him. So why does the media overlook this? The press loves the guy because they assume his bad ideas may never see the light of day, but one can dream. He wants to raise the tax rate for top earners to more than 50 percent, the highest in 30 years, after the worst recovery in history. His goal is not to get America back on its feet, but to put it under for good. He wants free tuition for colleges, a great idea if you think money grows on bongs. He said he'd hire Paul Krugman for his cabinet, which is like hiring Jeffrey Dahmer as your chef. Ah. He applauded Greece's no vote, which is like applauding two lovers as they jump off a tall building, which really is socialism, a leap. That always ends badly. Inevitably, you just run out of cash, just like you run out of distance between roof and sidewalk. So now the first thing I want to address is the fact that Greg Gutfeld referred to socialism as a failed ideology. He says that socialism is a harmless thing until it finds real power, then it's deadly. Well, fortunately for you and all of us, Bernie Sanders is a social democrat. <laughs> He doesn't actually advocate an overthrow of democracy. He wants a social democracy, which is a democratic welfare state that incorporates both capitalist and socialist practices. Now, if you actually were to leave that cave that you live in and look at the rest of the world, you'll see that many democracies around the world have major social democratic parties, such as Germany, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Costa Rica, Chile, Denmark, France, Finland, Israel, New Zealand, Norway, South Korea, and the UK. And I think that Greg Gutfeld would lose his mind even more if he found out how much communist parties exist in Europe. But don't worry, they've actually moderated as well and don't advocate an overthrow of the state. So Greg also says that Bernie would turn us into Greece or Venezuela. Well, no, if you actually listen to what Bernie says, he wants the U.S. to look more like Scandinavia, which would be beneficial for literally everybody who lives in the U.S., because that is the one region in the world that's really setting the standard for freedom and equality in democracies. So I agree with this, and I would love to look more like Scandinavia. Now, Greg Gutfeld also called Bernie Sanders a dope and says that Bernie Sanders is so nutty, most kids should be allergic to him. Get it? Because some kids are allergic to nuts. Yeah, <laughs> not very funny. <laughs> it's more of a laughing at you and then a laughing with you, Greg. So finally, he states, the press loves the guy because they assume his bad ideas will never see the light of day. He wants free tuition for, co for colleges. A great idea if you think money grows on bombs. Get it? Because all college students do is smoke marijuana all day. They never study. They never graduate. Ah, so this really made me mad because yes, Greg Gutfeld, you may think that Bernie Sanders has bad ideas, but it's your party who sent us to war with Iraq, which led to 200,000 people dying, okay? Yet, the Republicans want more wars. They want wars with Syria, wars with Iran, a proxy war with Russia, presumably. So, if you are going to actually critique Bernie Sanders and call his policies bad ideas, then you need some introspection and you need to really look at your own party's ideas. Bernie Sanders wants people to get universal education. He wants them to get health care so that way if they get sick, they don't die. Okay? He wants the rich people in this country to pay their fair share, as they should. He wants free universal health care. He wants to get money out of politics so that way the people in Congress actually represent us and not their corporate donors. He wants to fight climate change so that the one planet that we have that's habitable stays habitable. So what a loony idea, right, that people should... Uh, 
get health care if they're sick. So the problem with Greg Gutfeld is that he hasn't looked at public policy opinion. A majority of Americans agree with Bernie Sanders' ideas. For at least 10 of his policy ideas, he has over 50% support. Not, that's not a plurality. That's a majority of Americans, and that includes support among Republicans for some ideas, such as getting money out of politics. So, Greg, you're not funny. So, um, And as more youth people reach the legal age to vote, you're going to see that your ideology will slowly but surely fade into obscurity, and then we'll see who has the failed ideology. So, question for my viewers. What's your favorite policy proposal by Bernie Sanders? Comment down below. And also, check the description box because you can get a free 30-day trial of Amazon Prime and also support the show. Bernie Sanders recently drew a crowd of over 10,000 people in Madison, Wisconsin, and this scared the Republican Party of Wisconsin, which prompted them to put up this billboard. So don't visit the website on there because I did it for you so that way we don't give them any additional clicks. But let's look at the actual image that they posted to their website. So I'm going to break these apart one by one. First, looking at Hillary Clinton. Most of the issues that they raise about her are entirely sound. I mean, yeah, she does dodge questions in the press. Um, she shouldn't have had that private email account when she was Secretary of State. Um, and also... It's probably a case that she is engaging in pay-to-play politics. Now, there's one critique that I disagree wholeheartedly with um, when it comes to Hillary Clinton. So, they say that she would go further than Obama in protecting undocumented immigrants. Well, she should. This is a critique that a lot of people don't realize is mostly just spurred by xenophobia and racism. Because if you actually look at Supreme Court cases such as Plyler v. Doe, Yick Woe v. Hopkins, Wing Wong v. U.S., well, they state that regardless of citizenship status, individuals within the jurisdiction of the U.S. are afforded all the same constitutional rights as citizens. So this really gives them cognitive dissonance because they don't want to believe that undocumented immigrants actually do have constitutional protections even though they're not citizens. So that point is stupid. Now, when it comes to Bernie Sanders, however, there wasn't a single attack that they did that was actually warranted. So now the first one, they say he's a self-proclaimed democratic socialist. Okay, this confirms that no Republican ever knows what a democratic socialist is. I'll read you the definition. Democratic socialism is a political ideology advocating a democratic political system alongside a socialist economic system, involving a combination of political democracy with social ownership of means of production. This isn't old-school socialism where he wants to overthrow the state. This is social democracy. Germany, Australia, Canada, the UK, these all have major social democratic parties. So the, the point of scaring people is just stupid when it comes to that. Now also... They say that he suggested a 90% tax rate on some Americans. Why don't you go a little bit further with that statement? Why don't you elaborate on who he wants the 90% tax rate on? He wants it on rich people. And another thing that they leave out is that he's proposing a marginal tax rate. So, for instance, if you make, uh, let's say, $500,000 per year, anything that you make over $500,000 will be taxed at 90%, whereas anything that you make under $500,000 is taxed at, let's say, 25-35%. So they're being extremely disingenuous with that particular point. Now, 99 to 99.9% .9 of the country wouldn't be affected by this. So I think that it's really, really scummy and sleazy of them to try to attack him as if um, they're trying to scare individual people that their taxes are going to be raised, when that's not the case. Okay, so the next attack, they say um, that Bernie Sanders sent a letter to President Obama that urged him to raise taxes without Congress. Again, they're not giving you the whole story. What Bernie Sanders asked President Obama to do was to close tax loopholes via an executive order because Congress was not acting. So, yeah, it's true that in the event, um, if Obama did want to raise taxes by executive order, well, of course that would be against the Constitution, but this isn't what's happening. What Bernie Sanders wants Obama to do is close tax loopholes. So if I choose not to pay 50% of my taxes, if... The state makes me pay my taxes. Is that a tax raise? No, because I'm the one that's breaking the law. So, yes, we do need to close tax loopholes, and if an executive order is going to be the way to do that, then there's nothing in the Constitution that's explicitly against that. So, finally, they say he called to deep cuts to America's defense budget. Okay, if you look at the actual amount of money that we spend, and then you compare it 
to the rest of the world right here, you'll see that there's nothing wrong with this position. Over 57% of our discretionary spending is on the military. That's over $700 billion per year. So we could cut defense spending in half and still outspend the next biggest spender in the world, which is China, and we can outspend them by double. So you'd be unreasonable not to want to cut defense because instead of killing people abroad, instead of letting people in this country die because they don't have health insurance, why don't we actually take that money and spend it on benefiting us because it is our money. We are paying our tax dollars. So that's just a really dumb point. So if you really want to attack Bernie Sanders, the Republican Party of Wisconsin, all you guys, well, you're going to have to try again because you failed. You can't find nothing on him, can you? It's because he's reasonable and the American people love his policies. So one last thing. Now, they refer to Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton as the candidates of yesterday. Now, you can say that that's true when it comes to Hillary Clinton because she is part of the estab establishment. So she is going to continue to perpetuate the American corporateocracy that we have. But it's just weird that they're applying this to Bernie Sanders because, yes, banning marriage equality and increasing defense spending and giving tax breaks to corporations, that's, that's a new innovative idea, which is what your party wants to do, right? But when it comes to actually helping the American people, oh, what an extremist. He's just so far left. He's a looney tune, right? Wrong. Sorry, but the American people disagree with you and they agree with Bernie Sanders. Nate Silver of 538 Politics recently argued that Bernie Sanders could potentially win Iowa and New Hampshire, but still lose the Democratic nomination overall. Now, before you guys worry, um, just hang on, I'll go over his argument, and then at the end of the video, I'll explain why I think he still has a very, very good chance in spite of this new finding. So, Nate Silver writes, Hillary Clinton's campaign is now telling reporters that she is at risk of losing Iowa to Bernie Sanders in the February caucuses. Clinton's campaign is probably right. Sanders could win Iowa. He's up to 30% of the vote there. He could also win New Hampshire, where he's at 32% of the vote. Now, he says one explanation for Bernie Sanders' uh, popularity is that Democratic caucus goers in Iowa and Democratic primary voters in New Hampshire are really liberal and really white. And that's the core of Sanders' support. So the two primary states that he's currently surging in, New Hampshire and Iowa, they do have some of the largest shares of liberal white voters, which makes Bernie Sanders win in those places that much more likely. I'll put up the chart right now. Um, and this shows the top states with um, the most white liberal voters. So now the biggest hurdle is that Bernie Sanders currently isn't doing so well among non-whites. Silver explains, put another way, Iowa and New Hampshire aren't representative of the more diverse electorates that Democrats will turn out elsewhere. Clinton performed well among Hispanic voters in 2008. She now has excellent favorability ratings among black voters. If Clinton begins to see her support erode among these groups, her campaign will have some real reason for concern. So is it the case that Bernie Sanders could win Iowa and New Hampshire and still not get the Democratic nominee? Well, of course that's the case. I mean, this is an undecided election. Let's not forget that Bernie Sanders is the underdog, but he is surging a lot. Now, to look at that point, um, because Nate Silver explains that, yeah, he's surging in these two states, but they have the most liberal white voters. Well, one thing that he's not taking into consideration yet is the fact that Bernie and Hillary Clinton have not debated each other yet. See, Clinton has the advantage of just having pretty much universal name recognition in the U.S. So if you're a Democrat, you're going to know who Hillary Clinton is. And if you're a Republican, you're going to know who Hillary Clinton is. When it comes to Bernie Sanders, that's not really the case. A lot of people in Vermont know him. A lot of uh, progressives know him. But with the rest of the country, they don't really know who he is yet. A lot of non-white voters don't know who he is. But guess who's aware of this? Bernie Sanders, and he is currently coordinating um, outreach to African Americans, to Latino Americans, and to all types of minority groups, and he's doing a phenomenal job at doing that. And you're going to see it really pick up, but here's the thing that you can't really um, put into the equation yet, as Nate Silver couldn't predict this yet, but the amount of popularity he's going to gain from debating with Hillary Clinton. Once these debates take place, you're really going to see that his um, his ratings are going to surge even more. And this is because all of his policy ideas are right in line with the American people's, whereas Hillary Clinton is more centrist. But Bernie Sanders actually agrees with the American people, and they agree with him on a lot of the proposals that he has submitted thus far if he becomes elected. So... We shouldn't worry just yet about this, because even though Nate Silver and uh, 538 Politics, they are very, very accurate with their predictions, you can't predict things like um, 
approval ratings when it comes to debates and whatnot. It's just really impossible to do, and you can't do it accurately. So the takeaway, of course, it is possible that Bernie Sanders could win, could lose even after uh, he wins those two states, but is he actually a real contender to get the Democratic nomination? Of course he is, and the problem that he, have right, that he has right now, which is his biggest problem, is the fact that he's really not well-known among non-white voters. Well, I really think that this problem is going to slowly but surely be ameliorated over time. So look, the campaign just got started, we still have a lot of time, Bernie knows what he has to do, and I think he's going to do it, and he's going to win the Democratic nomination. The momentum is not going to stop. Bernie Sanders recently made a really powerful speech on the Senate floor about how Congress is just way out of touch and that some aspects of the U.S. are just sad. Take a look. I am always amazed by the huge disconnect that exists between what we do here in Congress and what the American people want us to do. The simple truth is, as poll after poll has shown, is that Congress is way out of touch the truth of the matter is that while working families are desperately trying to find quality childcare at an affordable cost, we are turning our backs on those families. The result, millions of children in this country are not receiving the quality childcare or early education that they need when the psychologists tell us, tell, psychologists tell us that zero to four are the most important years of a human being's life in terms of intellectual and emotional development. What sense is that that we ignore the needs of millions of working families and their children? What sense is it to tell working moms and dads that they cannot get the quality and affordable childcare they need? What sense is it to send many children into kindergarten and first grade already far, far behind where they should be intellectually because they had inadequate childcare. This is not what a great country is supposed to be about. When we talk about the future of America, we cannot be talking about turning our backs on the children of this country. And that is why we should be doing in this country what nations all over the world have done, and that is invest in our kids and move toward a universal pre-K education system for all of our children. Tonight, today, the United States represents 4% of the world's population Yet we have 22% of the world's prisoners. Incredibly, over 3% of our country's population is under some form of correctional control. According to the NAACP, from 1980 to 2012, the number of people incarcerated in America quadrupled, quadrupled from roughly 500,000 to over 2 million people. In America, we now spend nearly $200 billion on public safety, including $70 billion a year on correctional facilities. $70 billion a year on correctional facilities. Mr. President, it is beyond comprehension that we as a nation have not focused attention on the fact that millions of young people are unable to find work and begin their adult lives in a productive way. We cannot, cannot, cannot continue to turn our backs on this national tragedy. Let me be very clear, and I think I speak for the vast majority of people in this country, and I hope the majority of members in the United States Senate. It makes a lot more sense for us to be investing in jobs and in education to be than to be spending billions of dollars on jails and incarceration. Mr. President, we have got to start creating a situation where our kids can leave school and lead productive lives, not have them arrested and incarcerated. 
Mr. President, I have introduced legislation along with Representative John Conyers in the House that would provide five and a half billion dollars in immediate funding to states and cities throughout this country to employ one million young Americans between the ages of 16 and 24 and to provide job training opportunities to young adults. Now, some people may say, well, five and a half billion dollars is a lot of money. It is. But it is a lot less expensive to provide jobs and education to our young people than to lock them up and to destroy their lives. Mr. President, as we debate uh, ESEA, and again, I want to thank uh, Senators Murray and Alexander for their important work. I want this issue to be on the table, and I intend to offer an amendment that says in this country we're going to put our young people to work, we're going to get them an education rather than locking them up. So before I even get into the discussion about this video, I really want you guys to watch the full video. So if you have time, do it. Um, I'll put the link in the description box because it's really phenomenal. He actually discusses a broad range of issues, and I think that he was really poignant, and uh, it was just it was a fantastic speech overall. So I can't recommend that enough. Now, um, he makes the claim that he says Congress is way out of touch, and of course, as always, Bernie Sanders couldn't be more right. But why are they way out of touch? Well, it's because of money in politics. See, since Supreme Court cases such as Bucky v. Vallejo, um, Citizens United, McCutcheon, well, the Supreme Court has held that money equals free speech. So now these mega rich donors can basically buy out politicians. And it's not for as much as you'd think. They're not giving them too much money. I mean, the billionaires are giving upwards of um, tens of millions of dollars. But I mean, on average, a lot of these uh, donations are within the five to ten thousand dollar range, so you could buy a politician. Uh, you could buy them for really, really cheap. <laughs> but I mean, I guess that's a matter of perspective. Um, so since these Supreme Court cases, there's just been a huge influx of money in uh, politics. Now, Congress doesn't care about all of these issues that Bernie Sanders brought up, and that's because their donors don't care about it. You see. What they get elected to do is what their corporate donors wants, because what's the goal of a politician? Their one goal is to get elected. And um, if they don't appease their corporate donors, if they don't dance for them and do what they want, then they're not going to get an office. So that one priority that they have when they get an office is to appease all of their corporate donors one by one. Now, if you think that their corporate donors are going to be okay with them taking the time to discuss other issues other than their tax breaks, or... You think they're going to be okay with them taking the time to say, look, let's re reallocate funding. Let's take from defense or let's let's tax the rich and fund universal pre-K. Do you think their donors will be happy with that? No, not at all. So this is why nothing really gets done. Now, Bernie Sanders is one of just a few politicians that's not corrupt. So you have, uh, what, Elizabeth Warren, um, Jeff Merkley. We did have Ron Wyden, but recently he was corrupted uh, with the TPP. And now he seems to have just been entirely bought off. Um, we have Alan Grayson in the House, potentially the Senate, because he is running in 2016. So we have just a small little handful out of hundreds of people who are not corrupt. This is sad. This is really sad. You see, if we actually get money out of politics through Wolfpack or other types of um, initiatives, well, then we're actually going to have a lot more Bernie Sanders, because guess what? If we publicly fund elections, which is what Bernie Sanders wants, well, then we can actually not have to worry about who our politicians are representing because they're going to represent their constituents directly because they don't have to worry about appeasing their corporate donors because they're not the ones who elect them now. It's us. It's our tax dollars. So if this is the case, if we publicly fund elections, well, then, well, then that will make them a lot more representative. There was a um, there was a study in 2014 by Dr. Gillins and Page who found that we are not represented at all. They have a regression model where they computed all of this, and what they realized was that um, the American people and voters, well, none of their policy positions are addressed, whereas the donor class, which is the millionaires and billionaires in Wall Street, all of their policy positions are right in line with Congress. So, yeah, it's the case that we are not represented. Now, when it comes to Bernie Sanders' speech, and getting back to that, what I really love about his speech is that he's so genuine, he's principled. I mean, you can really hear the frustration in his voice. He's not doing this 
to further his own career. He is doing this because he genuinely wants to help the American people. And that's something that you want. You don't want a politician who just has career aspirations because they're going to be influenced by money in politics, which is a corruptive force. Um, but Bernie Sanders, he is just doing this because he's on a mission. He sees that America needs help, and we're not getting it right now by the people who's in office. So Bernie Sanders, just know that that frustration that you feel, it's also being felt by all of us too, and that's why we thank you, and that's why we're talking so much about Bernie Sanders on the Humanist Report, because, look, if this guy doesn't get into office, then this is just going to continue to perpetuate, and our corrupt system is never going to do anything for us. When it comes to the policy positions of Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, well, the differences are like night and day. But there's another difference with respect to how each candidate carries his or herself. So BuzzFeed writes, Clinton, as one of the most scrutinized figures in politics, followed wherever she goes by the press and a band of secret service agents, faces particular challenge in this campaign of making herself accessible to the everydays as an everyday American herself. Now, she took part in a parade in Gorham, and BuzzFeed explains, Reporters were free to walk in the street next to Clinton until about halfway down the route, when two campaign aides brought out a thick white rope, which they held like a clothesline in front of the candidate. Members of the press were forced to stay on the other side. Clinton moved quickly, and to keep up, reporters trotted backwards, rope at their waist. The idea, aides said later, was to create a buffer, a space where the candidate could interact. So now here's some photos of that particular event. So now the alleged reason why they wanted to have the ropes is because there was a guy and a couple of other protesters that were yelling at her the whole time and they were getting pretty rowdy. And here's a picture of the guy. So he just has a picture of Benghazi. So clearly he has a substantive argument because... That's clearly a scandal. But anyways, regardless, I mean, she had protesters there, and that was the reality of the situation. But, I mean, if the rope was really a precautionary measure, then why didn't they rope off, like, protesters? Why did they rope off the press? I don't really understand um, the point of the buffer. But anyways, um, there was screaming from protesters. There was also screaming from her fans who were chanting, Hillary, Hillary, as well. Um, and one of the Clinton aides said, I can't tell if that's booing or cheering because the crowd was so rowdy. Now, they even tripped a little boy with the ropes to which a Clinton aide said, oh, he looked all right. <laughs> well, I hope so. I mean, you're you're trotting out these ropes and trying to cage off uh, reporters. What do you expect's going to happen? It's a parade. There's families there. There's little kids. So it wasn't really a well thought out idea, in my opinion. Now, so not a great time, right? It doesn't sound great if you have protesters following you around and whatnot. Well, when asked about it um, and asked whether or not she had a good time, Hillary explains, yeah, it was fabulous. You know, I love parades. I love walking in parades. We got such a great response, a lot of enthusiasm and energy to celebrate the 4th of July. But it didn't really seem that way, though, Hillary. So again, this is one of those um, problems that I have with her. Is she being disingenuous? Probably so, because it didn't look like she was having a good time. Um, so this doesn't help Hillary's image. Now, she has multiple aides with her. There's a buffer zone, people carrying rope to rope off the press. It's just not a good look, and I don't think it really helps her with the everyday normal people, because us normal people who go to work every day, we don't have um, aides following us around to have like a buffer zone around people we don't like, you know what I mean? So I don't know if this is going to really help her with her image. So now, for comparison, here's pictures of Bernie Sanders in large crowds of people. So, he's got cameras right in his face. He has swarms of people around him. But, do you see his rope? Me neither. Me neither. Now look, let's be 100% fair to Hillary Clinton. It is the case that the media attacks her, but not, you know, leftist media outlets such as uh, MSNBC and then CNN once in a while. And sure, but you want to know who else is attacked? Well, Bernie Sanders. They call him an extremist. They call him a looney tune. Greg Gutfeld recently called him a dope. I don't even know what that means, but they called him a dope. They called him a nut job. See, so he's attacked as well, but he's still personable. Now, to be even extra fair, to critique my own self, this is an ad hominem attack. It doesn't say anything about her policy positions. It's not substantive, so all I'm critiquing her on is something that doesn't really matter in the end, but I do think that personability, I think I just made that word up, but <laughs> to be a personal candidate will help her in the national election. Now, Bernie is that personable 
candidate. Look, I don't hate Hillary Clinton. I think that before, she was ahead of her time as well, because back in the early 90s, she proposed universal health care, although people kind of burned... Um, uh, they, they made like a scarecrow. There was a video that I watched of them burning Hillary Clinton for proposing this. So, yeah, she was a progressive for her time, but she's since moved further and further to the right and is a centrist on some issues and a neocon on some issues, such as foreign policy. So, again, the takeaway, this is not a substantive critique. It's something that you can just disregard, and I fault myself for that. But I wanted to talk about it because I think that it really does show that you 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 need to be personable, like Bernie Sanders says. She needs to be right there with people. What she needs to do to be successful is get across that she's not just this rich oligarch who only wants to further the establishment's cause. She needs to actually act like a real human being, but she's not doing that. You, if you ask her a question, she'll be like, hmm, I think this kind of is the case. This is my answer. This isn't my answer. But when you ask Bernie Sanders, he'll just tell you. He doesn't have to wait two weeks to devise a perfect response with his aides. He's just being himself. He's speaking off the cuff. And that's what I think Hillary Clinton really needs to do, because right now she does have a personality deficit with respect to Bernie Sanders. So Hillary, you can't be doing things like this. I know, I know again, I feel bad for critiquing her on this because I'm not looking at her policy issues, but... It's something that I really think is important. You've got to come across as one of the American people. In a letter to a potential billionaire donor, Haim Saban, Hillary Clinton promises to fight against the growing international BDS movement, whose aim is to economically isolate Israel through an organized boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Now, in this letter, she writes, I know we need to make countering BDS a priority and fight back against further attempts to isolate and delegitimize Israel. BDS seeks to punish Israel. Now, foreign policy explains that Hillary Clinton aims to diffuse Jewish donors' concerns that a Clinton presidency would be marred by the same tensions with Israel as Obama's has been. And they conclude, on July 1st, one day before Hillary Clinton's letter was written, Politico reported that Saban donated $2 million to a super PAC supporting Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. So initially, when I read this, two things stood out to me. First is the fact that this is really frustrating how much money in politics really influences politicians, because we'll never really know what Hillary Clinton's true stance is on Israel, and this is the case with many other politicians. Who knows if they support a two-state solution? Who knows if they actually want to condemn the war crimes that Israel has perpetrated against Palestine? Who knows? Because if they don't tout this line of thinking, then they're not going to get elected. Now, the second thing that really stood out is all of the implications that came to this. Although she did indicate support for a two-state solution, as she thinks it would help Israel, what she's really saying is that she's against the two-state solution because Israel is against a two-state solution. So now I'll kind of discuss the situation. I mean, you can't grasp all the nuances of the Arab-Israeli conflict in, a, in like a 10-minute video, 5-minute video, whatever it is. Um, but I think that we can go over some of the details that are really important. So so is Israel in the wrong? Well, according to a UN Security Council resolution number 446 in 1979, the policy and practices of Israel in establishing settlements in the Palestinian and other Arab territories occupied since 1967 have no legal validity and constitute a serious obstruction to achieving a comprehensive, just, and lasting peace in the Middle East. So Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories is illegal. Now, because of this, Israel is the one that are the offenders. They are continuing to annex more Palestinian land and build more and more settlements all the time on their territory. Now, this is problematic because what this does is it fuels more extremism and anti-Semitic sentiment. See, anytime Palestine has applied for statehood at the UN, the US blocked it on behalf of Israel, of course. Now, what Palestinians want is a state, just like we wanted a state before, um, when we fought in a revolutionary war because of it, just like many countries have wanted. They want their own state, they want their own independence. So, one thing that also fuels this is because it's practical. They don't want to continue to lose their homes. They don't want more settlements built on their land, and rightfully so. So, yeah, I think it's reasonable that they do want their own independence because Israel is not treating them justly. Um, so what happens whenever they do this? What happens whenever Israel goes to war? Um, well, they receive blowback. So they fuel more um, extremism. Hamas would have never been elected 
have the Palestinian people actually achieve statehood. Now, in fact, Hamas's approval ratings surged during the 2014 Israeli incursion into Gaza. So this is the same thing that occurs with our government as well, because our imperialistic um, endeavors into the Middle East, we killed 200,000 more people, and this fueled a ton of extremism. Now ISIS exists because of our actions. So now, of course, that doesn't justify extremism. Violence is never an answer. But with that being said, Israel does have a right to protect its citizens from Hamas. However, the response is not proportional. That's just not been the case. So over 2,000 people died in Gaza due to Israel's incursion into Gaza. Now, 551 of them were children. The civilian casualty rate was 80%. Israel killed Palestinians indiscriminately. This is very, very clear. Now, on the other side, is it the case that some members of the IDF, which is Israel's defense force, had died as well? Well, yeah, there was about 80 people that died on Israel's side, but the majority of them were not civilians. It was maybe about 10 to 15 that were civilians, which is something that you expect with war. You don't expect that much collateral damage unless you're killing people indiscriminately. So let's actually look at the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement and what they want to do. So just as sanctions help to pressure the uh, South African apartheid regime, well, this would do the same thing. It would put economic pressure on them. Um, and hopefully get Israel to the negotiating table, because at this point they haven't been wanting to negotiate. Um, the Palestinians went through Jordan to kind of propose a new deal, which would take them back to the 1967 borders, and Israel just said, nope, we're not going to negotiate with you at all. They rejected it outright without even looking at it. So when it comes to the actual BDS movement, these aren't people that are anti-Semitic. What they want is peace on both sides. They want peace for the Israelis as well as the Palestinians because the right-wing Israeli government is the one that's perpetrating all the actions and both the Palestinian people and the Israeli people are paying for it because the Israeli people have to pay for the, um, the blowback that comes to fruition socially and the anti-Jewish sentiment for the actions of their right-wing government. So... A lot of neocons will use this tactic. They'll say, "Well, what? You don't support war?" Because they'll do this in the they'll do this in the U.S. too. They'll say, "What? You don't support war? Well, then you must not support the troops. And if you don't support the troops, then you probably hate America. So why don't you get out?" But you can't do that. You can't put yourself above criticism and say, "Look, if you critique us, you're just anti-Semitic. If you critique us, you're anti-America. You can't do that, okay? That's not something that is reasonable in a democracy. So." The main goal is peace for both sides, as I said. Both Hamas and even Fatah, look, they're not in any way the good guys, but Israel is the most powerful country in the region. So they have all the power. They control the situation. So if they really wanted a two-state solution, guess what? They can get a two-state solution. Now what matters is that both Israelis and Palestinians can live in peace and not be punished by the immoral actions of both of their governments. However, if Hillary fights back against the BDS movement, then this is not going to be conducive to a two-state solution anytime soon. But here's the deal. If a two-state solution isn't actually achieved, then how is it that peace can really be a reality in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine? I mean... It's going to only continue to perpetuate violence if the occupation continues, because citizens on both sides are going to pay the price for their government's politics. But here's the deal. Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, he doesn't want a two-state solution because war is lucrative, and guess what? It helps him win elections. The Likud party, which is Netanyahu's party, they actually really benefited because they said, look, elect me and I'll protect you from those evil Palestinians and that evil Hamas who wants to bomb you. But sure, Hamas is evil and they shouldn't be bombing Israel, but I mean... Who kills more people? That's what we're looking at it from both a quantitative and a qualitative perspective. Okay, both sides have done wrong. That's that's no doubt. But the fact of the matter is that Israel is the one with the power. If they want the two-state solution, they can do it. The power is in their hands, not the Palestinians' hands. So this is going to continue with President Clinton if she is elected, presumably. Now, the U.S. is really the only state that's powerful enough to actually pressure Israel. We can just not veto... Palestinian statehood and they would get their own state and this would help their cause a lot. But if Hillary Clinton becomes president, well then this is going to be the case. Now to be fair, we don't necessarily know um, Bernie Sanders' position explicitly, but we can know that his position is going to be a lot more reasonable because he's not influenced by mega rich donors. So my question to my viewers is, do you think a two-state solution is actually contingent on the US? If we don't act, is it ever possible for a two-state solution to exist? Comment down below. Jeb Bush has a peculiar new plan that he thinks is going to help fix our economy. We have to be a lot more productive. Workforce participation has to rise from its all-time modern lows. 
means that um, people need to work longer hours and and through their productivity gain more income for their families. That's the only way we're going to get out of this rut that we're in. So let's actually examine the statistics in order to see how hard Americans are actually working. ABC News writes, not only are Americans working longer hours than at any time since statistics have been kept, but now they are also working longer than anyone else in the industrialized world. And while workers in other countries have been seeing their hours cut back by legislation focused on preventing work from infringing on private life, Americans have been going in the other direction. So when it comes to the proportion of the population that's actually employed full-time, it's 46.7%. Now, of those people, 8% work less than 40 hours per week, 42 work 40 hours per week, 11% work 41 to 49 hours per week, 21% of those people work 50 to 59 hours per week, and 18% work 60 plus hours per week. So if you think that we're not working hard, you're horribly mistaken now. 85.8% of males and 66.5% of females work more than 40 hours per week according to 20-something finance. Now, when it comes to um, statistics from the International Labor Organization, Americans work 137 more hours per year than Japanese workers, 267 more hours per year than British workers, and 499 more hours per year than French workers. So there is more. According to the U.S. Bureau, I don't know why that was so hard for me to say, um, of labor statistics, productivity has increased by 400% per American worker. So now there's also no laws that mandate sick leave at the federal level. Additionally, the U.S. is the only advanced industrialized country that does not legally mandate annual leave. So we take less time off, time off than everyone else and we're also highly productive. So I'll show you this chart. So now, is it really the fact that he thinks that American workers don't work very hard? Well, unless he's been living under a rock and has looked at any data over the last mm, forever, well, I think I know what it's really about. This is what it's about. So Jeb Bush wants to continue to give pointless subsidies to the oil industry. He wants our tax dollars to subsidize corporate welfare. And he also wants to perpetuate the military industrial con complex. So he wants us to continue spending over $700 billion per year on the military, which is completely unnecessary. Now, he also wants to give tax breaks to pretty much all of his rich friends. But wait, Huffington Post writes, Jeb Bush says his remarks on Americans needing to work longer hours were misconstrued, telling reporters in New Hampshire he intended to advocate greater job opportunities for people involuntarily working part-time. Sure, Jeb Bush, whenever you say something that gets a lot of backlash, you were just taken out of context. It's not the case that you're actually just out of touch with the American people and that you're an oligarch and you're a multi-millionaire and that you have no idea what the ordinary American goes through. So stay classy, because I'm sure that your message is going to really resonate well with all of your rich buddies on Wall Street, but it's not going to resonate with us ordinary people, because we actually have to work. What you want to do is you want to get into the White House, and just like your brother, you want the rich to get richer and the poor to get poor. In a new video, Sarah Palin really presented a pragmatic, nuanced, and thoughtful argument against Elizabeth Warren's plea to raise the minimum wage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Totally kidding. Um, it was completely incoherent. <laughs> take a look. Fast food workers deserve a livable wage, and that means when they take to the picket line, we are proud to fight alongside them. We believe... Oh, wait, I thought fast food joints? Oh, don't you guys think that they're like of the devil or something? That's what... Liberals, you want to send those evil employees who would dare work at a fast food joint that you just don't believe in. thought you wanted to... I don't know, send them to purgatory or something. So they all go vegan and uh, wages and picket lines. I don't know, they're not often discussed in purgatory, are they? I don't know, why are you even worried about fast food wages? Because, well, we believe in America where minimum wage jobs, they're not lifetime gigs, they're stepping stones. So first and foremost, the one thing that really struck me is that she's presumably drunk. I mean, she's incoherent, she's belligerent, she's rambling, she's not making really any sense at all. She looks as though she can't collect her thoughts. So that's one thing that's odd, because you don't really see public figures acting in this way, because it's not really professional. Now she says, who's worried about fast food wages? Um, me? 
reasonable people who aren't horrible. <laughs> Fast food workers, maybe. Maybe they want to actually survive after working 40 hours per week. Uh, now, one of my favorite parts is that in the midst of her rant, she remembers, oh yeah, I have my talking points. And she says, these aren't permanent jobs, these are stepping stones. Well, that's actually false. This is something that you hear from the Republican Party all the time, but it's completely a just made up lie. So now, 30% of fast food workers are between the ages of 16 and 19. That's it. So 70% of fast food workers are 20 years of age and older. The largest share of fast food workers is between the ages of 25 and 54, which is at 36.4%. So now, Obviously, it's the case that these aren't just stepping stones. That's the reality of our situation. Fast food jobs employ millions and millions of Americans, including not just teenagers. Now, I can't even believe that I'm trying to actually address her argument as if it's substantive, <laughs> because I don't think that she really thought through her argument very well. She just wanted to attack Elizabeth Warren, because that's what Republicans do. They attack people, um, which is ironic, because I'm doing that right now. But um, really, this is embarrassing, but it actually made me feel really bad for her, right? Because... I mean, who does this type of thing? I mean, if you are presumably drinking and then making videos, but you try to present yourself as a legitimate political figure, well, that's not a really great way to kind of further your brand. Um, so I'm hoping that there's not some underlying issue here, such as depression or something that's really affecting her, because look, this is the humanist report. We care about human people, and I don't want anyone to suffer. So if this is the case, that she is actually suffering from something like a mental condition or whatnot, then I really do feel bad for her. But I'm guessing that it's just Sarah Palin being Sarah Palin and making word salad. Ugh. On his upcoming trip to Kenya, President Obama stated his intent to pressure the anti-gay President Kenyatta on his homophobic record. BuzzFeed explains, White House Press Secretary Joshua Ernest said Monday that President Barack Obama would not back off LGBT rights when he visits Kenya later this month, despite calls from senior Kenyan politicians that he steer clear of the issue. Joshua Ernest states, I'm confident that the president will not hesitate to make clear that the protection of basic fundamental human rights in Kenya is also a priority and consistent that we hold dear here in the United States of America. When the president travels around the world, he does not hesitate to raise concerns about human rights. Now, credit where credit is due, President Obama, for the most part, and from a comparative standpoint, he does have a fairly decent record when it comes to human rights. Now, he does have sway in a lot of other countries as well, which is why I think it's very important that he utilizes his bully pulpit and uses his power and prestige to pressure these um, homophobic governments. Now, I want to really reiterate what Joshua Ernest said. He says when the president travels around the world, he does not hesitate to raise concerns about human rights. Well, unfortunately, that wasn't the case a few months ago. Take a look at this video. Will you speak about the blogger to the well? The you know, I, I think on this visit, obviously, a lot of this is just uh, paying respects to King Abdullah, who, in his own fashion, uh, represented some modest reform efforts within the kingdom. Um, but we have maintained a sus uh, sustained dialogue with the Saudis uh, and with all the other uh, countries that we work with. You know, what what I found effective is. Uh, to apply steady, consistent pressure, even as we are getting business done that needs to get done. Uh, and uh, oftentimes that makes some of our allies uncomfortable. Uh, it makes them frustrated. Um, sometimes we have to balance our need to speak to them about human rights issues uh, with immediate concerns that we have in terms of countering terrorism or uh, dealing with regional stability. Uh, but the trend line is one that I will sustain throughout uh, the rest of my presidency, and that is to make an argument to those friends and allies of ours that if they want a society that is going to be able to sustain itself in this age, uh, then they're going to have to change how they do business. So now, the person who Fareed Zakaria is referring to in the video is a Saudi Arabian blogger known as Raif Badawi. What he did was he made a blog post calling for free speech for atheists, and he critiqued the Saudi government, and he was locked up and sentenced to 1,000 lashes. Now, what's more is that the Saudi government is so peeved by him that they actually are currently seeking to extend, or actually not necessarily extend, but to make his punishment more harsh, and they want to now sentence him to death. 
And just know that the Saudi Arabian government, their human rights record is so bad that Raif Badawi's lawyer was actually arrested and sentenced to 15 years in prison, I believe it was, because uh, Raif Badawi's lawyer actually called for international pressure against the Saudi regime in order for them to release Raif Badawi, because I think that free speech is a human right. We can all agree on that. So the problem is that Obama, sometimes he's great on human rights, but other times he's willing to not say anything. And as you can tell by the video, he was really uncomfortable when uh, Fareed questioned him because it's something that is a little bit contradictory. If you are going to really tout your human rights record, as Joshua Ernest did for President Obama, well, then you got to be consistent on it. You can't say, well, this country, you can violate human rights, but in this country, you're... You can't do that. <laughs> See, another problem with Obama is that he's currently negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, when you look at states such as Malaysia or Brunei, Brunei, they kill gay people. They have Sharia law. They implemented it about a year ago. And Malaysia actually has literal slaves. But yet, he's willing to do business with them in spite of their horrific human rights record. So... Obama, this is great. Credit where credit is due that you want to pressure President Kenyatta of Kenya, but you got to be consistent. Do it elsewhere because it's something that the international community will actually like, and it'll help contribute to your record as a human rights activist. Cy Robertson, one of the stars of Duck Dynasty, purported the claim that atheists don't exist. Take a look. So Cy, what do you think we can learn from the interaction between believers and non-believers? Well, look, you know, if in a war zone, what better place, okay, to know about the gospel? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, these men are facing death every second, okay? So what better place like to find out that God loves us so much he sent his son to die for us, okay? And that through him we can have all our sins removed, okay? And then we can live forever, right. okay? Because he beat the grave for us. Amen, amen. Well yeah. said. But it's just, you know... Uh, <clears throat> What we tried to do with this film, okay, Faith of Our Fathers, okay, it's got it's got three folds, okay. The gospel is presented clearly, okay, between the two you're talking about, the two dads, mm -hmm. okay. One is a skeptic, okay, and there's a lot of skeptics, okay. A lot. And it's, I, you know, I don't believe there's no such thing as an atheist. That's an interesting. You know, no, I'm statement. serious. You know, because there's too much there's too much documentation, okay. Our calendars are based on Jesus Christ, okay? Whether you believe in him or not, mm -hmm. every time you sign your, your calendar, you write down the day's date, you're saying he's here, okay? That's documented, okay? So, you know, like I said, I don't believe there is any atheist, okay? Boom! Checkmate, atheist. <laughs> I like how the interviewer um, was like, oh, that's an interesting claim. And then Cy was like, I'm serious. He's like, oh, <laughs> he wanted to look over to his dude. It was like, <laughs> because it's like, did he really just say that atheists don't exist? Because even that's a little bit weird for me and I'm a Christian. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so now um, to clarify what Cy Robertson is actually trying to say is that he doesn't think that atheists exist. Because if you listen to the actual quote, he says, I don't believe there's no such thing as an atheist. So what it sounds like is that I don't believe there's no such thing as an atheist. I don't believe that there is no such thing as an atheist. That's a false statement. I agree with you. <laughs> but no, no, but in actuality, what he's really trying to say is that um, he doesn't think atheists exist. Now, for his reasoning, it's really, I think, sound. It's nuanced. It's, um, it's researched. <laughs> so he says, there's too much documentation. Our calendars are based on Jesus Christ. Whether you believe in him or not, every time you sign your calendar down today's date, you're saying he's there. Okay, so hi, buddy. First and foremost, our calendar was actually created by an Italian astronomer named uh, Luigi Lilio, and it was only named after a pope. Now, second of all, does this also verify the existence of the Islamic God, seeing that they too have their own calendar? Does it uh, validate the Buddhist religion because Buddhists also have their own calendar? Hindus have their own calendar? And guess what? Even the Satanists have their own calendar. So do all of these religious figures actually exist because they have their own calendar? Yeah, do you see why this argument is problematic? I don't know if he's going to see that. See, this is someone who's not really reasonable because he doesn't base his opinions and ideals on facts or logic or empirical reality. What he operates on is solely based on emotion. 
But what's scary is that this person, he actually has a platform. He's literally an author of a book. Now, even though he has a ghostwriter, um, it's still the fact that his ideas are getting on paper and they're being absorbed by other human beings. This wouldn't matter. He'd be harmless if he was just some nobody. But this dude has millions and millions of followers and is making money off of espousing garbage like this. So that's why it's problematic, and I really hope that his fans see through him and realize that his reasoning is irrational, but unfortunately, don't know if I have that much hope in them. Welcome to the Weekly Roundup, where I go over news stories you might have missed over the last week. This week, Donald Trump alleges that if he can actually secure the Republican nomination, that he'll be able to get the Latino vote. I'm not making this up. I have great relationship with the Mexican people. I have many people working for me. You can look at the job in Washington. I have many legal immigrants working for me. Many of them come from Mexico. They love me. I love them. And I'll tell you something. If I get the nomination, I'll win the Latino vote. I will win it. Donald, there's just one problem with your assertion. Oh, I don't know, what was it like maybe a couple of weeks ago you just called all Mexican immigrants rapists? They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. They're rapists. So if you thought that you'd actually get their vote before this, then you're wrong. But if you actually think you can secure their vote after making those insidious comments, then you're just delusional, and this is what you look like. <laughs> I rule. <laughs> Here we go. This is gonna be cool. Recently, Reza Aslan and Hassan Minaj recently wrote a letter to American Muslims asking them to embrace marriage equality. They write, To our fellow American Muslims, Hey there. It's two of your brothers. We're writing to you about the Supreme Court's decision to legalize gay marriage in all 50 states. The good news is that a whopping 42% of you already support marriage equality, as do both of our Muslim elected officials in the United States Congress. One even serves as vice chair of the LGBT Equality Caucus. There are many faithful gay and lesbian Muslims in the U.S., and we love them and support all of them. They add, here's the thing, when you're an underrepresented minority, whether Muslim, African American, female, etc., democracy is an all or nothing business. You fight for everyone's rights, and the operative word here is fight. Or you get none for yourself. Democracy isn't a buffet. You can't pick and choose which civil liberties apply to which people. Either we are all equal or the whole thing is just a sham. Bottom line is this. Standing up for marginalized communities, even when you disagree with them, is not just the right thing to do. It's the Muslim thing to do. Remember, that whole God is merciful and compassionate thing? That extends to all people, not just those who are straight. This is really fantastic. I don't always agree with Reza Aslan. I'm probably like 60-40, where I agree with him 60% of the time. But oftentimes, he's made some really odd remarks about atheists, saying that atheism is a religion, which I disagree with. But when it comes to this issue, I think that he's spot on, and I think that he's doing a really great thing. He's putting a face for the secular Muslims, the huge majority of secular Muslims that we actually have in this country that people don't really know about because the mainstream media likes to fearmonger about the Muslim community. Now, one thing that I really hope is that this letter will apply to religions everywhere, because not all religious individuals are so friendly to the idea of LGBT rights. So when it comes to the not-so-loving religious population in the country, the Michigan State House recently passed a bill called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is a broad piece of legislation that would legally codify discrimination against LGBT people. So pretty much what this would allow them to do is it would allow an individual to discriminate against anyone they want to based on their religion. For example, EMTs can refuse emergency treatment to gay people. A Christian businessman can refuse to hire a Muslim worker. A Christian firefighter can say, what's that, you're gay? Well, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. It's because of my religion. I know you pay your taxes and everything, but my religion overrides your right to actually have me put out your fire that you pay for with your taxes. So this is just really ridiculous. Now, it's the case that this might not necessarily become a law, but if it does, it would blatantly violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which is a huge problem. So. You can be a Christian, but that doesn't mean that you're entitled to violate our constitution, which is the supreme law of the land. So this is my message to you. Stop breaking the law, asshole! 
Well, that's our show. I want to thank all of our viewers for watching, and I also want to welcome all of our new subscribers to the channel because that number has been going up very, very fast for me. Um, not not in comparison with all the big guys such as Young Turks and whatnot, but I mean, our numbers are looking very, very good. So if you are new to the channel, then I welcome you, and I really want to thank you for watching. If you have any suggestions on topics that you want to hear, uh, please comment down below because I will be more than willing to talk about them. It seems like everybody really wants the Bernie Sanders videos, and guess what? I want to talk about Bernie Sanders. He's my favorite politician, maybe of all time. So, um, yeah. So I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I will see you all next week.